in about two-thirds of the world, Christians of one stripe or another face some sort of harassment. It can result in imprisonment, torture, and even martyrdom for the cause of Jesus Christ. The level of brutality is almost unbelievable. Christians in innumerable countries are under huge amounts of pressure, either from the government or from the societies in which they find themselves. They number some 2.2 billion people, and harassment can range from loss of life to loss of livelihood. Christians have become an endangered species in some countries of the world. Well, thank you for joining for today's The Persecuted Church. And as always, it's my delight to say welcome to Andrew Boyd. Thank you for joining us, Andrew. And always a pleasure, Gordon. Thank you. One of the uh, popular programmes on Revelation TV is called Jerusalem Dateline, presented by Chris Mitchell, who has the grand title of Bureau Chief for the Middle East for CBN News. The Americans love to have grand titles, don't they? They have to do. think about them for some of our staff as well. But um, I was in a charity shop recently, and whenever I go in, I love to look around the books, and I came across a book that Chris Mitchell had written entitled Destination Jerusalem and it's Christian persecution and preparing for the days ahead. Well, I've been enjoying reading it and I've got a quote for you uh, from it today. This is an article that he wrote uh, that, that was written in 2014 by the president of a world uh, Jewish Congress, a gentleman called Ron Lauder, and he wrote it for the New York Times. And in it he said, why is the world silent while Christians are being slaughtered in the Middle East and Africa? In Europe and the United States, we've witnessed demonstrations over the tragic deaths of Palestinians who've been used as human shields by Hamas, the terrorist organization that controls Gaza. The United Nations has held inquiries and focuses its anger on Israel for defending itself against its own terrorist, terrorist organization. But the barbarous slaughter of thousands upon thousands of Christians is met with relative indifference. Let me just remind you, that was written in 2014. That's 10 years ago. And Ron Lauder, who's the president of the World Congress, he went on to say that he'd been speaking to a huge gathering of Christians in Belgrade um, earlier in the year. And he said to them, History, historians may look back on this period, and wonder if people have lost their bearings. And he said, I make a solemn promise that just as I will not be silent in the face of the growing threat of anti-Semitism in Europe and the Middle East, I will not be indifferent to Christians suffering. God's people must join together and stop this revolting wave of violence. I found it very prophetic what he was saying, bearing in mind what's happening in the late 2023 and the uh, beginning of 2024. But at the end of his article in the New York Times, he took a verse of scripture out of our New Testament. And it was 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. And there we read the words, sorry, I should have said it was 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. And there we read the words, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. And as we look at the news and as we share stories today on the persecuted church, we don't want you to be fearful, not for a moment. That's not in our thinking. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. So let's just pray as we watch this program and refuse a spirit of fear at what we see and hear. Instead, let's let faith rise. 
So Father, we thank you that your word, Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And Nehemiah eight ten says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we thank you so much, Father, that the amazing thing is that we can have an unreasonable joy in the face of trouble because your Holy Spirit is at work within us, stirring us to faith and stirring us to make positive faith confessions, positive prayers. Lord, we just ask that you get the glory and that through all of this, Father, you stir up a spirit of faith and fill us and fill our brothers and sisters with the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, before we go into our main persecution report for today, we want to share a story with you, a story about a couple who've faced all the persecution that we're talking about and yet have done it without the fear and instead with love and of a sound mind. I want you to listen to the story of Simin. That's not her real name. She comes from Iran, uh, experienced hostility from the authorities, her work and even her own family, but her faith is not diminished. Have a listen. It was May 2023. Pastor Zachariah had been away from home and was returning to his village in Mangu, central Nigeria. Unaware of a devastating attack that had taken place, he started noticing people fleeing in the opposite direction. Most of them were barefoot. Their bodies were covered with mud because they'd had to crawl to escape the attack. The closer I got to my house, the more I saw people with injuries and dead bodies beside the road. My house was completely burned down, including everything inside. I looked around the house to see if I could find my wife and son, but I couldn't find them. Finally, I checked all the rooms inside my house and found their dead bodies in the kitchen area. The attack on Pastor Zachariah's village was one of several in the region that killed 125 people in a single week. The Fulani militants didn't explain why they targeted the mostly Christian communities. My opinion of why we were attacked is that it was their wish for us to be converted to Islam. And they hoped that by chasing us away, they would have more space to graze their cattle. When it happened, I felt like God had forsaken me. I began to think, if he's the true God, then why did he allow them to attack us? Where was he? Where was God? Why did he not take action? Open Doors Partners invited Pastor Zachariah and other survivors to spend time at their trauma center. There he could find relief from the many questions weighing on his mind. Truly, if I hadn't come for this training, I think that life would have been very hard for me. Because in the months before I went for the training, I couldn't sleep. My thoughts kept going back to the attacks. But after receiving the trauma care, my mind is at rest. This teaching really has encouraged me. And they also taught us to forgive those who attacked us. I want to tell people who find themselves in situations like we've experienced, my prayer for you is that we should rely on God because he is everything we live for. Our main focus today during the Persecuted Church program is upon Ukraine and particularly the part of Ukraine which is under Russian control as well as Russia itself. We don't want to get into the politics of the situation but we want to talk specifically about the way that Christians in those areas are being affected by the war that is taking place between Russia and Ukraine. So here is Andrew and the Persecuted Church report. Into the third year of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Christian leaders are being killed, tortured and are disappearing. And in Russia itself, priests who oppose President Putin's invasion 
are being imprisoned or silenced. And yet, in Ukraine, there are signs of a growing hunger for the gospel, with reports of churches packed to overflowing and many giving their lives to Christ. In February, the body of a Ukrainian Orthodox priest was found in the streets of Russian-occupied Kherson. He was 59-year-old Stepan Podolchak. According to his bishop, Russian military forces had tortured him to death. Father Podolchak was hauled away barefoot with a bag over his head, say Norway-based Forum 18. His bruised body was later found in the street. According to some reports, he'd been shot in the head. Churches that are not Russian Orthodox face persecution and many have been closed. Some priests have been deported, others have disappeared. Father Podolchak had been pressured to desert the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and join the Russian Orthodox Church instead. Despite the danger, he chose to remain with his congregation under Russian occupation. He's been described as faithful to God, pure in soul, honest and just. Other church leaders have suffered the same fate. In November 2023, Pentecostal deacon Anatoly Prokopchuk and his 19-year-old son Alexander were kidnapped and shot in Kherson. Their mutilated bodies were found four days later in Woodland. And in Russia, Christians have been jailed for refusing to take the Putin line. It's reported that 300 priests signed a petition condemning his invasion. Yet, despite the growing oppression, God is at work in the conflict. Pastor Alexander Salfetnikov was tortured by the Russians. He managed to escape with his wife to an area still under Ukrainian control. There, his new church is filled to capacity. Most are non-believers. At one service, 30 came forward to give their lives to Jesus. 30 more responded to the gospel at another service nearby. Release International's associate says, people flock to the word of God and convert to Christ, in whom they find their only hope in the conflagration of war. Well, we want to say thank you to Andrew for preparing that report for us on uh, Ukraine and also on Russia. Uh, Andrew, just recently there's been an election in Russia and I guess the result is a foregone conclusion. We knew it before it even was taking place there, but is there any implications from it? Oh, most certainly. I mean, 87% of Russians apparently voted for President Putin. I'm rather surprised that he didn't quote claim that 120% of Russians had voted for him, considering the only real opposition is in prison, in exile or dead. Uh, people like Alexei Navalny. In fact, we'll be talking about him a little bit more later. So, talking about Ukraine and particularly the, the part that Russia occupies as well as Russia itself. Tell us a little bit about persecution. Is persecution happening? Because we don't hear about it at all in the news. Well, it's happening and it also seems that it's getting worse, Gordon. So growing persecution has been flagged up by the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. They say freedom of religion is continuing to decline sharply across the Russian Federation and occupied Ukraine. And there are tough new laws that they're bringing in. They target Protestant, Catholic and other religious groups. And affiliates of Release International who are working in the region warn that these findings are only scratching the surface. So Andrew, give us some examples. Tell us what we're really talking about. So some practical examples here would be uh, Release International Associates, Voice of the Martyrs. They've highlighted a number of cases. Firstly, two landmark court cases in Chakota where individual Christians have been fined for giving out Bibles and Christian books, defining that as illegal church recruitment. So if that were you, if that were true in the UK, you give out a tract to a friend, that's illegal church recruitment. Mm. So for the first time, a court has declared it illegal for an individual to give away Christian literature. And this represents a new level of restriction on personal evangelism. Similarly, a Christian in Armavir, Russia, was fined for distributing the Christian newspaper, Do You Believe? Now, may, there may be people, you may be watching this program, you may distribute good news or a magazine like that. 
If you were in Russia, you'd be in trouble. And in Moscow, a pastor was jailed for 12 days for taking humanitarian aid to Christians in Luhansk. Now, a Release International affiliate, Dr. Hyun Suk Foley, she says this, I'm quoting her, no matter what the Russian government does, these ordinary Christians simply continue their service to the Lord. Amen. Uh, Andrew, I was particularly intrigued in your report that you talked about churches closing and particularly Orthodox churches that were closing. So I I is it really happening? And, and how's the church being affected in the Crimea, the part of Russia, the part of Ukraine that Russia owns? Yeah, it, it is happening. Many religious groups have faced increased persecution under military rule in the occupied areas. Churches closed include those of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Baptists and Greek Catholics. Churches are being required to apply for registration under Russian law, which means of course they could refuse it. So two other examples of church closures. When the Russian military seized Zaporizhia Baptist Church, they also took away all the communion vessels. And it was reported on Russian controlled TV that they had found disgusting sects within the region. That's how they regarded these Christians. Now the congregation in Zaporizhia responded to this by praying for those who were oppressing them. Jesus taught us to do exactly that. He said, pray, bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you. And that's what they're doing. Another example, in the eastern Ukraine town of Balaklia, Russian troops arrested a pastor, Alexander Safnetnikov, of the Light of the Gospel Church, and they almost tortured him to death. Uh, on that occasion, the Russian-appointed mayor went into his chapel and he declared, there will be no God here. There will be no Christians, only the Moscow Orthodox Church. And those occupiers looted the building before desecrating it. And yet, Andrew, your report says that there's a hunger for God, that churches are, 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 are filled, that people are, are coming to Christ, that even one high-profile person has, has come for Christ. So you've got that dichotomy, haven't we? Well, it always happens. You know, when the, when the darkness gets darker, the light gets brighter. So that hunger for God can be clearly seen, and you were hinting at it just then, in the story of Alexei Navalny, the well-known opposition leader who reportedly turned to Christ shortly before his death. Now, Navalny, who many believe was murdered for opposing President Putin, he was a late convert to Christianity. He's reported to have embraced the Christian faith while in prison in Russia. This report on Alexei Navalny's late conversion is from CBN. 47-year-old Alexei Navalny was President Vladimir Putin's fiercest opponent, crusading against official corruption and organizing large anti-Kremlin protests. He died in the Arctic penal colony where he was serving a combined 30-year sentence. Many believe he was murdered. At his sentencing in 2021, Navalny, once an avowed atheist who had made fun of organized religion, surprised the court when he said he had become a Christian. Sergei Rakuba is the leader of Mission Eurasia. While he was at the court, I believe he presented the most powerful a sermon out of that cage. You know, he was kept in at the courtroom. He said that he's not atheist anymore. And referring to the Bible as an ancient book that the world should adopt and build their rules for living and for daily living. Navalny returned to Russia in 2021 against the advice of many after the government had tried to poison him. He continued to mention his faith on social media. Some thought Navalny's conversion a political tactic, but Rakuba believes it was genuine. When we started digging more, we now see that in the process, when he had to go through all the challenges, I mean, fighting for the, his life, he said that he found God. And now communicating with some of the church leaders in the evangelical community, we understand that he was in contact with few and uh, searching for eternal values, as he says. When Navalny announced his conversion to the court in 2021, he quoted from Christ's Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He said he viewed this verse as a command that he needed to do something to save his nation. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Andrew, that's our God. 
he can reach anyone and he is reaching anyone. It's amazing what he's doing. But, but wasn't Navalny, certainly before his impris recent imprisonment, he was an avowed atheist, wasn't he? He was a committed atheist. He used to mock religion. But in his final days, he said it was he who was now being mocked by militant atheists, which is just extraordinary. So what really we're trying to say today is yes persecution is taking place and it's terrible that the, the way that people are being persecuted for faith but out of it we're seeing God at work. We're seeing God's hand and we're also seeing God's heart. I mean while persecution is a terrible thing, it's nothing to be celebrated, we find that God is powerfully present to bring hope right in the middle of times of trouble. Faith needs to rise in these circumstances as we were praying earlier. And where the gospel is preached, those churches are growing. So what we're finding is that again and again, in times of hardship and oppression, it really seems to concentrate not just the mind, but the spirit and people are responding to Christ. And uh, so it's not a spirit of fear, but it's actually a spirit of, of love and of sound mind because God is doing the most amazing things in the hearts and lives of people. When all else is stripped away, then people begin to think about who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? You know, it's, it's absolutely no surprise that we think like that because that very strange book in the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes, it says God, has set eternity in the very hearts of humanity. So let me ask you today, tough question, the biggest question of all, why are you here? Why did God put you on this earth? And what will you say to him when he takes you home? Big questions. But listen, they echo that most beautiful passage of Scripture, one of my favourites, Psalm 139. Let me just read a little to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. What an amazing picture that is. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now God has always known us and he's always had a plan for our lives. And at the heart of that plan is to know him even as we are fully known. The Bible says deep calls to deep and God calls each of us to know him, to know and experience his love and to pass on that love to others in the unique way that is gifted each of us to do that. So what I would say is, don't wait for trouble to search out the meaning of your life. God, who lovingly made you, made you for a purpose. You're not here by accident. You're here for a reason. And if you want to know what that reason is, then it makes sense to ask the one who made you. And what he promises is that if we search for him wholeheartedly, we will find him. As it says in James, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. It's an amazing experience to, have a, to know the Lord. And I know that so many of you who are watching Revelation TV today um, are prayer warriors for the Lord. And we say thank you for that. And thank you for standing with so many of our brothers and sisters, like the ones in uh, parts of Ukraine, like the ones in Russia, who are really struggling in terms of their faith. And, and we'd say simply to, to any of you who are watching who don't know God like that, then to call out to him. Prayer is simply talking to God in the intimacy of, his, uh, of our being. And if you're wanting to hear from God, then we'd encourage you to read the scriptures for yourself and begin to look at them and just see what God has to say. And he will speak into each one of our hearts. But let's go back, shall we, to, to Russia and to the parts of Ukraine that we're talking about. Um, what's gonna happen next? How, how do we pray? Uh, what's it all mean for, for Christians? Well, let's go back to that big question, which is the question, why? Why did President Putin invade Ukraine? And let's just take three main justifications that have been given for that invasion. The first given by President Putin is that Russia felt under threat from its neighbor which they say was in the grip of Nazis. So he has to denazify Ukraine and remove that threat. 
Let me just stop you there because that, that's the first point. And, and in a sense, we're not going to answer it. But in what, what makes him think that there's such a thing as Nazism in Ukraine? Well, whenever you, if any authoritarian power, any authoritarian leader will need to persuade their own people that there is an enemy within and an enemy without. And so this is the enemy without. And it's really ironic because, of course, Ukraine has a Jewish president. So the notion of, of it being a Nazi state on their border, conjuring up the specter of Nazi Germany, mm. well, I mean, you can form your own opinion about that. But that's one justification. Here's the second. To prevent the expansion of NATO on Russia's borders, which, as Finland and Sweden have now, because of that invasion, both joined NATO, that's been a fairly spectacular own goal in all of that. And the third reason that's given is a religious one. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, has described the war as a struggle for the, I'm quoting, eternal salvation of ethnic Russians. That's how this is being framed. And that's worth further investigation because 71% of Russians are, identify as Orthodox. And the Orthodox Church has rushed back in to fill the vacuum left by the Soviet Union, by communism. President Putin has portrayed the invasion of Ukraine as an attempt to save Christian civilization, by that he means Russian civilization, from the decadent West. Others in the Kremlin have referred openly to a holy war, and observers have described that President Putin is on a messianic mission. Well, we, I think we need to step back to try to see the big picture, to try to understand what's going on. Because if we do that, we can pray more effectively. In Europe, the Orthodox religion has roots that stretch way back to the 10th century. In the world, they go back further, but in Europe, it's to there. And that's 10th century Ukraine, which is interesting. And both Putin and Patriarch Kirill, head of the Orthodox Church, they want to bring to heel the breakaway Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which they're portraying as heretical. They want to bring them back under the control of Moscow. Let me just interrupt you there, because this is the, the heart of the issue. I, I, I remember early on, I saw, well, there's an Orthodox church in, in Russia, there's an Orthodox church in Ukraine, and you assumed that we're all part of the same. But actually, they've split, haven't they? And yeah. become really quite enemies against each other. Yes, that's right. And so it's being shown in Russia, it's being portrayed as an attempt to bring back to order, to bring back. I mean, Ukraine is known in Russia as little Russia. They see it as part of them and they're calling them back to the fold, whether they want to go there or not. And that fold, there's a term for it in Russia. They call it the Russian Mir. If you think about the space station that the Russians put up, Mir, it means Russian world. And by, by that, they mean the Russian speaking countries that have historical ties to Russia. They include Belarus and Moldova. And we'll come back to Moldova in a bit. Now, these are countries within the sphere of influence of Russia. And all of this, this is not about returning to the Soviet Union. All of this predates the Soviet Union by about a thousand years with a common language, common culture and a common faith. Well, we come to this whole question of Ukraine. Russia clearly believes that Ukraine should come back under the Russian fold. But the question is, where is it going to stop? And if we listen to our news programmes uh, on, on the secular television, they're all talking about the, the countries that are around and the danger that's going to come. So um, what's it mean for Christians? Well, you can see what it means for Christians when you look at what is happening in the occupied areas of Ukraine. If you think about, if you widen that question, say, what does it mean for the whole of the world? You need to see it through Russian eyes. I, I was listening to BBC Radio recently and I, my breath was taken away by a quote from a former member of the Russian Duma, an associate of President Putin. His name is Sergei Markov. And he described this conflict uh, in direct quote, a war of aggression by Western countries who occupy part of Russia, which is Ukraine. So they see Ukraine as part of Russia, who are trying to destroy Orthodox Christianity. In other words, the feeling within Russia is that the West started this conflict rather than Russia. The Ukraine is a rightful part of Russia and that the grand plan of the West and its allies is to destroy the Russian Orthodox Church. In other words, they're playing this out as a holy war. Yeah.
So it's a Christian war. It's very much involved in that. Well, there are a number of countries that are around Russia, and, and one particular country that uh, you particularly wanted to talk about was Moldova. Yeah, so we're talking about a war now that's going on into its third year. There's growing concern that President Putin has his eyes beyond Ukraine on the tiny country of Moldova. Now, if Russia were to invade Moldova, and there's concern that, that he might attempt to do so, then Moldova's small evangelical community would face a very dangerous future. Okay, well, before we listen to a report from CBN and George Thomas on Moldova, we just want to, we haven't been on a plane journey today, have we? So let's imagine for a moment or two, we board the plane, shown our passport, and we're flying to Moldova. I wonder how many of you know where it is. Have a watch. Alexander Belev remembers when at seven years old, four Russian KGB officers showed up at his parents' home in Moldova. All us five siblings had to sit in one room as they searched the house for Christian literature, Bibles, and anything related to Christianity. The agents found all sorts of Christian literature in the house that morning in 1982. They hauled Bailiff's father, a prominent underground Baptist pastor, off to prison, where he spent the next two and a half years behind bars for his faith. This is video captured secretly that day of his father being led through prison gates. Several weeks later, the young Bailiff would visit his father. Bailiff, pastor of a church here in Moldova's capital city, Chisinau, now faces the prospect of enduring the same Christian persecution his father suffered 42 years ago. Two years after the war in Ukraine, we know the very real scenario that Russia could easily invade Moldova, and if that happens, we'll have the same type of persecution that is happening today in the Ukrainian territories occupied by Russia and like it was during Soviet times. Home to roughly three million people, Moldova sits between Ukraine and Romania. Russia's war against Ukrainian forces raging barely 100 miles from Moldova's border. I have no doubt that the Russian military planning has an invasion of Moldova on its books, something they're thinking about and something they can easily do if they want to test the West. So far, Ukraine has managed to stop Russians from advancing west of Kherson in their drive to take key strategic cities like Mykolaiv and Odessa, and likely preventing a potential march on Moldova. Again, we are very thankful to Ukraine for their resistance uh, because this is a guarantee for the peace in Moldova. But the spark that could ignite a potential Russian invasion of Moldova could happen right here in a region known as Transnistria. CBN News traveled to the pro-Russian breakaway territory of Moldova's northern front along Ukraine's border, where Moscow has in recent months stirred up political turmoil. We made our way through several checkpoints manned by Russian troops to the region's capital of Tiraspol, where a huge statue of Lenin adorns the town square. Pro-Russian rebels here have asked President Vladimir Putin for protection against what they claim are economic threats from Moldova's government. While the majority here in Transnistria would rather be part of Russia, they know that Moldova's recent tilt west and desire to join the European Union are giving the Kremlin heartburn. Experts believe Putin is using Transnistria as a Russian proxy to scuttle Moldova's EU aspirations. People are more anxious. They're concerned about their fate and the possibility that they be forced to leave their homes because of an invasion. Analysts warn that if Ukraine falls to Russia, Moldova will most certainly be the Kremlin's next target. And George joins us now from Kherson, Ukraine, very close to the fighting. George, let's start with your story. You spent time with an evangelical church in Transnistria, and they're surrounded by pro-Russian rebels. How are they holding up in this situation? Yeah, it's, yeah, Wendy, it's incredible. I mean, this is the largest evangelical church, as you mentioned. They are swimming in a sea of pro-Russian sentiment, and they continue to preach the gospel. In fact, the, the man who leads the church is from Melitopol, Ukraine. And today, uh, Wendy, his city has been taken over by Russia. And so he and his wife moved to 
uh, to Transnistria back in 2000 to be missionaries, and they have lived there ever since. And they said, come what may, we will continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ despite the circumstances, despite the hardship. Just imagine for a second, their hometown is in Melitopol, uh, Ukraine. It is now under Russian control. So they know very clearly what it means to, to live under Russian occupation, yet they continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's the largest church, like I said, they reach out to uh, former drug addicts. They reach out with uh, to children who, are, who have been left orphaned. In fact, Orphan's Promise has a major partnership uh, with the church. So good news in the midst of very, very difficult circumstances and political situation, Wendy. And as we mentioned, George, you're in Kherson, uh, Eastern Ukraine, about a mile away from Russian forces. There's a lot of Christians, a lot of believers in Ukraine. How are the Christians at work serving people in the war zone? Yeah, in fact, we rushed from our location just to come and do this live shot in the middle of this food distribution being done by a fellow uh, member who is a member of this community of Kherson. Uh, huge explosions, and he had to run. He, had to, he said, let's go, let's go. We got to get this distribution, got to get this food to these people. Keep in mind, we went to a community probably about one, two, three, four, five huge apartments. It's less than a mile from Russian forces, and they continue to stay there. In fact, I asked one of the ladies, guys, why are you here? You heard the explosions. And she said to me, where, where do you want me to go? Mm. This is my home. I was born here. And so this is all they know. And, you know, the Christians that I, I joined, they came and they brought food, hygiene, uh, material, and other food supplies. At least they know that somebody cares for them uh, a mile uh, from the Russians. So, there are the countries that we want you particularly over this coming month to be praying for. To be praying for the Christians in Russia, to be praying for the Christians in Ukraine, both in the part that is, is still independent and the part that is under the control of uh, Russia. How we need to be praying. There's a breakout of God's Holy Spirit and the most amazing things are happening. We just don't hear about them and see about them, but if you watch Revelation TV, you'll be hearing about them from time to time. We began by showing that scripture from uh, 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7, which talked about we haven't got a spirit of fear but we have a spirit of love and self-control. And that's what we need to be praying for the Christians in those countries and many other countries of the world. There's a great song which says that uh, no longer do we have, are we slaves to fear. Let's worship together. And as you do, let's pray and think about the Christians in Russia and in Ukraine. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance From my enemies Till all my fears have come I'm no longer a slave to fear
through the wonders of technology, we can travel all over the world, and that's the wonderful thing. And we're praying that the spirit of fear will not be present in so many countries. But what about our own country, the place where we live, the United Kingdom? If you watch Persecuted Church regularly, you'll know that from time to time we talk about stories particularly that affect the United Kingdom and Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. And it seems to be, but it's a, it's a growing happening across the country, Andrew, doesn't it? Persecution, discrimination, whatever you call it. I mean, the, the culture and the climate here is just becoming a little bit more difficult. Uh, but there are champions in this particular field, and I know that you want to talk about one of those. We do. We want to honour today a gentleman called Colin Hart. I don't know how many of you know Colin, but he was the founder and director of the Christian Institute. And certainly if you've watched Revelation TV, you'll have seen from time to time reports that have come from the Christian Institute. He had a, a suspected heart attack in March from which he died. And uh, I know that they are sorely missing him and his family are, and we need to be praying for him. I just looked up about Colin, and it said that he was born in West Sussex in 1963 studied maths at Newcastle University, went on to be a maths teacher in uh, that area. And then together with a friend, John Byrne, they had the idea for the Christian Institute. And so in 1990, um, Colin left his teaching and became the founder and set up the Christian Institute. And they've done a remarkable job just last month we, we actually showed a piece, didn't we, Andrew, of uh, a, a man, a preacher in Scotland who was arrested. And in fact, we're going to show it in a moment or two, just to remind you of it. Why don't we do that now? This was something we showed last month about Christian Institute. A street preacher in Scotland has won damages from Police Scotland after he was wrongly arrested over a hate crime incident. Angus Cameron, a former pastor at Cumnock Baptist Church, received £5,500 in damages and £9,400 in legal costs following his arrest and unlawful detention in Glasgow City Centre in 2022. Told that he had been arrested for breach of the peace with homophobic aggravation, the evangelist was handcuffed, searched and put in the back of a police van for over an hour. Mr. Cameron has donated all of his compensation to the Christian Institute, which supported him throughout his ordeal. The Institute's Kieran Kelly is here to explain more. Kieran, how pleasing is this outcome? Well, uh, Joanna, it's very pleasing. Obviously, um, this is an important victory for free speech as well as for religious liberty. You know, there's nothing in the law that says that you, the police can arrest someone simply because someone somewhere claims to be offended. And let's remind ourselves that uh, Angus Cameron uh, was arrested entirely on the basis of a, an unsubstantiated complaint of homophobic, using homophobic language. He was uh, handcuffed and stuck in the back of a van for, for over an hour. He hadn't been offensive. He hadn't uh, been aggressive in any way. He'd merely been quoting from the Bible. And that was, that story was backed up by bystanders. Uh, officers may not um, understand the Bible. They may not understand why some Christians want to go out and uh, preach on the streets, but they should know the law. And in this case, they didn't. Uh, and uh, thankfully, it wasn't terribly long before they realised their mistake and recognised that no criminal behaviour um, had taken place. And that's just one example of the work of a Christian Institute. And the thing I found interesting is you never see Colin Hart on the screen. He, he doesn't seem to appear. He's just happy. He was happy in the background just to make it all happen. But what an impact he's had. Yeah, he was a very good speaker too. And, and I, I think he's a real hero of the faith. And it's worthwhile mentioning alongside the Christian Institute, another body which you'll have heard of, I'm sure, Christian Concern. They're doing something very similar to the Christian Institute in that they are speaking up and they are championing these issues which affect people in the UK. So I, it's a biblical mandate, I believe, to speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. And particularly, Proverbs 31.8 says this, speak up for those who have no voice. Speak up for the poor and needy. Judge fairly. And so they are 
addressing the laws of the land where those laws are against the laws of scripture or or they clash with them you know the, the, the boundaries overlap slightly they're championing that and they're championing the right of people to be able to follow their conscience in the workplace and that's a right that's severely under pressure whether you call that persecution or whether you call that discrimination those who are in the front line of all of that certainly feel the heat and organizations like the christian institute and christian concern do an incredible job it's worth praying for them and it's worth supporting them because these things are right on our doorstep that's right if you look at the christian institute and the work that they do if they talk about abortion they talk about euthanasia and they talk about all practical reasons i mean that, that the street preacher that we saw in that piece a moment ago um he he was arrested and he was put in prison and um, if, if there wasn't an uh, an organization like the christian institute then nobody would have been fighting for his rights and he would have been an individual and nothing would have happened to him. So they're, they're doing a tremendous work in terms of taking up the cause as our Christian concern. And it's an uncomfortable role, you know, because it's effectively a prophetic role. It's a role that challenges our culture, it challenges our status quo. It's, I, I think I, I really all credit to them because they're putting themselves in the firing line. But I know that People that find themselves in that position, one of the hardest things for them is not the opposition they face from government and society. It's indifference and even opposition they face from the church. So they're doing a good job on our behalf and thank you Christian Institute, thank you Christian Concern for what you do. Let's pray for those guys. Amen and pray particularly for Colin Hart and uh, for those who are part of his family and for all of the Christian Institute as they just seek to know now how to move forward and uh, we say thank you for that work that they've done and uh, bless them for it. I came across a piece by a lady called Lady O'Caffeine. I've not heard of her but she was a member of the House of Lords, strong Christian. She died in 2021 but before she died she recorded a piece which just talked about the importance of a Christian Institute and the way that in the work that she was doing in the House of Lords she was able to use the papers that they prepared and she always knew, knew she said that they were first class. Here she is just describing Christian Institute. I have found the literature from Christian Institute fantastic. I mean, the literature in-depth analysis of particular issues is first class. It is very professionally done and every statement that's made is annotated. You know exactly, you can go back to the root document and gives me complete confidence in it so that I know when I actually quote from it on the floor of the house that I can justify everything I've said. The reality is that a lot of freedoms are being undermined and there is a sustained anti-Christian movement attacking those of us who actually believe in freedom of speech and freedom of thought and freedom of expression of one's Christian values. Christians can't lock themselves away in little cells. They've got to be aware of what goes on. Some of it's not very nice, but uh, to have a body like Christian Institute supporting you is actually very good. It's important that we pray for our nation. You, you know that, but we just want to say it again, don't we? And it's important at this particular time because the government have just in the last few weeks introduced this new definition of extremism. And, and whilst everyone's saying, well, it's good and it's right, but it should come in and it's only going to affect certain bodies, it's easy to see the way that it may creep and grow and affect us as Christians. If we look, for example, at, the, at India, what has gone on in India now, anti-conversion laws have been passed now by at least a dozen states. And on the face of it, they seem completely reasonable. They're banning people from forcing others to change their faith. They're banning people from bribing other people to change their faith. I mean, who wouldn't disagree with that? But the trouble is with it, it's so widely interpreted and it just creates a degree of friction. Many Christians are now in India facing uh, jail sentences, they, they are being charged with anti-conversion. These are people like you and me who are just sharing their faith. You talk about heaven and it's bribery. So uh, you give relief aid and that's another form of bribery. So it's, it's, it's how these things are interpreted. It's all in the detail. 
Okay, we want to uh, show you a little piece that uh, Simon Barrett did on his program where he was just talking about extremism and he got a guest who uh, knew what they were talking about and you may find it just helpful so that when you hear the talk about extremism you understand some of the issues. Have a listen. Um, what, what are your thoughts on this new proposed definition of extremism proposed by um, our communities uh, minister, uh, Michael Gove? I think perhaps right at the start, we need to think about the context of what this definition is. So it's not law, it's not criminal law, it's, it's not law at all, it's, it's guidance. And one of the rules of thumb when it comes to guidance is that those who are meant to be following the guidance are not mandated to follow the letter of the guidance. They need to have a compelling reason to depart from it but it's certainly guidance and it carries weight in that regard. Um, this was uh, put together in response to the Oct October 7th attacks. Michael Gove uh, has been very open about what drove him to come out with this at this particular point in time. Um, and it's designed to be more tighter and uh, narrower and precise in the definition of what extremism is or what the government understands it to be compared to the 2011 prevent strategy definition that definition which was considered to be far more broader and some would say vaguer uh, spoke about act being in active opposition to british fundamental values which are respect for the rule of law respect for democracy individual liberty uh, mutual tolerance and respect uh, of different faiths and beliefs or in some documents of people who have different faiths and beliefs um, so now there's a shift from action or potential action to ideology and the promotion of that ideology. But let's just, just remind ourselves that this is um, a scheme uh, that's specifically related to ministers deciding on funding, ministers and their civil servants deciding on funding for organisations and also whether they will or will not meet with particular representatives from different organisations. So the remit is actually quite specific. It should be said, and this is maybe my final thought on this, is that even if a group is not on that list, if you have, say, a group who has a conservative religious view of, of the world, other groups who are not on that list will then potentially be blacklisted because of their associations with the, ide the ideology. So th there are all sorts of problems with this uh, new scheme, I would suggest. So as ever, we've gone around the world today, haven't we? We've come back to land in the United Kingdom, but we've been to Ukraine, we've been to Russia, we've been to Iran. And I hope, and Gordon and I both hope together, that in all of this, there is a rise of faith from us because we're talking about difficult situations, they are challenging, but we need to meet them with faith, never with fear. So let's just pray out, Gordon, and let's just pray for, the, for our wonderful audience, and we thank you for joining us. Father, we respond with faith to all that you're doing. We thank you for the growth of the church in Ukraine. We thank you for the rapid spread of the church in Iran. Absolutely amazing under persecution. And we say, Father, give us also a rise of faith that we may be faithful to you in, in Jesus, Jesus name. name. Amen. And we pray for each of you too and just bless you for standing with us and standing with the persecuted church. May you know the Lord richly in each one of your hearts. God bless. Bye bye.